Shannon. Shannon and Sheila, two SHs. It's going to throw me. I apologize ahead of time. <laughs> Hi everyone, we're so glad to have you here today. Thank you for joining me in the Friday Forum. My name is Cindy McDonald and I am a person just like you that wears lots of multiple hats. I'm an educator, I'm an entrepreneur, and I'm an innovator, and I'm also an OMA. So I'm so excited to be able to share the this Friday Forum today. I have three guests, colleagues of mine that come from all parts of the country. So as you're logging in, and I see we already have over 30 people joining us, we knew this was going to be a popular topic. So as you're joining us, put your name and your location. And Carmen has put in the question in the chat, the question of like, did you see an increase in the number of early applications? So I'm glad to have Carmen here too. She, she's our production assistant and she keeps us going and keeps us on track. We will, we are expecting, this is an open forum today and we're going to talk about the admission season. And we are expecting lots of questions, lots of comments. Please use the chat to just share and talk. That's what I encourage you to do. But also please use the Q&A. We'll, we're going to save Q&A till the end for this session today, but use the Q&A to put your questions in there to make it a little easier. So glad to have you here. I wanna welcome Kathy and Shannon and Sheila here. I'm just so glad to have you guys. Thank you for being here today. Now, we'll, I'm gonna have each of you share a little bit about yourselves, give your name, your business, um, your location, and three words that would describe you. So, Kathy, let's start with you. Okay. Um, my name is Kathy. I am located in Charlotte, North Carolina. Um, three words that describe me. One, like Cindy, entrepreneur. Two, like Cindy, grandma. And three, lifelong educator. Perfect. Shannon, what about you? Hi, everyone. I'm Shannon Bergeron based in Austin, Texas. My company is Core College Consulting. Um, I'm in my seventh year running the business independently and 18 years as a school counselor prior to that. Um, let's see. I'm not a grandma yet. I probably won't be. But my three words are going to be adaptable, um, compassionate, and authentic. Oh, nice. Sheila, welcome. Hi, how are you guys? I'm Sheila Olson. I'm coming to you from Wellesley, Massachusetts, suburb of Boston. Um, I am a college advisor. This is my ninth year and I have former college and secondary school admissions experience. I was also a high school teacher long ago in my past for four years. Um, I think my words are big picture oriented, uh, detail focused and flexible thinker. I love that, I love that. I felt like because oh. our students are asked to do this all the time, that it might be fun and interesting for us to, to have that as well. So today we've come, we want to talk about the application season and just what we've gone through, what are most importantly, what our students and our parents have gone through. And so we've got a number of questions. We know we probably won't get through all of them, but we want to address some of these things. And in the chat, as you're joining or as you're listening, please feel free to add your thoughts. We will be saving the chat, so we'll have it available. Carmen will be adding any links or things, so if you have links, please put them in. But the first topic we want to talk about is the application deadlines, like early applications, regular applications. What is that season? Ben, what has this season been like and how have students reacted and managed this? So Sheila, what is your impression? And I know you have some data to share on this. Yeah, so my sense this year, uh, much more than in other years, is that more students are submitting more applications and they are submitting them earlier. Um, and the figure I read, um, I think a couple of weeks ago in the Chronicle of Higher Ed was that it's been a 41% year over year increase from 22 to 23, which is a massive number. Um, so the data does bear out that many students are 
you know, in some ways considering early action, the new regular action. I think that's a very interesting trend. And what do you think, why is that? Why are they doing that? I think high school counselors, IECs like us, I think people um, heard the colleges loud and clear last year, um, you know, and, and frankly, the year before saying they were getting more and more applications. And some people may think like I do, which is, well, you know, having sat in an admissions office, if you're getting just thousands and thousands and thousands of applications and you can no longer index GPA and test score for a lot of them, right? You, you right. actually can't rely on the numbers because you may not have some of those numbers. Then you're just reading to keep your nose above water. And that means that many of these large schools, the Clemsons or the Michigans, Wisconsin's, not only are they getting their decisions, their early action decisions out later, well into the new year, but also they're functionally rolling. You know, I think about it as an admissions person, you're just reading and going, yes, no, maybe, and you're not going back and, and maybe reviewing a lot of those yes and no decisions, right? You're just going. So spaces are filling. You're not Middlebury. You're not reviewing the whole class and all sitting down at a table and then deciding who you're going to admit. So the early bird, you know, may quite practically get the worm. Now, a lot of this is supposition, but some of it is based in having done some admissions work um, at both UCLA and, and at a mid-sized selective. And, and so I do know what it was like um, at a big state school, you know, and it's you know, three, five, six, 10 times worse, depending on the school you're at in terms of simply the sheer volume of applications coming in. Yeah, yeah, for sure. Shannon, what are your thoughts or experience with that? Um, yeah, I think definitely I have more students applying early. In fact, I have 35% of my seniors applying early decision or restrictive early action, which is definitely up for me. Um, so that's kind of an interesting, and I know there are several students who plan to possibly ED2, waiting on some decisions coming out this month as well. So I do feel like there's a lot of pressure on these kids to get their applications in early. In Texas, we're a little bit unique in that, like Texas A&M opens their application on August 1st, like everybody, and but they really push those early apps because the programs will fill up. So our Texas kids who are generally applying to state schools anyway, once they have those done, they're really ready to start submitting. Um, I def I had kids who are done before September 1st with all of their applications. And, and that's, you know, that demonstrates or illustrates the difference in the different parts of the country. So that's why knowing where you're at and what, you know, where you're experiencing with your students is so important because our students, they can even do a, a, a submit a UC application until you know um, much later, and a CSU doesn't even open until October. So it's you know it's impossible for them to have that early. So I know that's that's very true. Kathy, what about for you in your? Area? I, I would say the majority of my students finish early and are finished with the exceptions of people who want to ED2 or a couple of people who are applying to schools that only have EDs and, and regular, they're applying early in the new year. But I do think, you know, a part of me wonders, like, I, I feel like on August 1st, you know, the, the essays start becoming available. I feel like when the floodgates open, that the stress and the anxiety rises, you know, kids that know that they're going to be playing football, for example, in the, in, in the fall, can be eager to get things finished. Um, Sheila mentioned this before we got on the call that, you know, I think there's always going to be some students that you advise to hold off on not doing early, like if they had a really bad, you know, junior year and they, they need to sort of make up and, and, and prove something. But we were even talking about like, we don't even know how effective that is any, anymore. So I think that, you know, certainly where I am geographically, it makes sense for them to be done sooner rather than later. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I, I, yeah, I agree. And, and just the reduction of stress on them, you know, and we all try to have them apply to a school where they will be admitted, you know, basically and conditionally so that they have that in their pocket and that psychologically makes such a difference. So I do see a question in the chat that I'm going to go ahead and pose right now because um, I don't know the answer, Sheila, that you might know the answer. I do some an large answer. schools have software to ID keywords that will quickly eliminate? I mean, we know the use late and things like that. 
Awesome. That eliminate those nine qualified because we all know they have lots of students who qual apply who are not necessarily qualified at all. I have an answer. I don't want to say that it is definitive. Um, you know, I'm certainly out of date from being on the other side of the desk, but also I, I do keep up on this to the extent I can. Um, so no, not keywords. So let me be clear about that. It's not keywords. Um, we're, we're talking about numbers now. If you've got, if you're Princeton and an application comes through and it's a straight B student from standard level courses, the missions officer doesn't need to read that file. You know, I hope Princeton doesn't jump on me. They, they'll say they read everything. Um, the other thing I want to point out though is understand that whether it's the UCs or other large state schools, there's an increasing use of readers by these large state yeah. schools. Yeah. So admissions officers are maybe in many cases reading 20% of the applications, having uh, those applications have gone through a reader who has filled out a rubric and the admissions officers will look at the borderline cases. So I don't, you know, I think there was a there was a situation not so long ago, and maybe my Texas friend can help me out here. I, I, it was definitely, it was, I'm not sure if it was UT Austin, it was UT University or the system had been using um, AI uh, text sensitive software to review the recommendation letters of its graduate student applicants. And that that practice was discontinued after it got out into the public and they realized that, look, it disadvantages uh, students who come from backgrounds or, or come just from an institution, a school professor where they don't know the keywords. I will tell you um, at an Ivy League school, you know, it, readers can be trained to look at recommendations letters in particular. This is one of the best students I've had in the last five years. That's the secret sauce or the secret code. Does every guidance counselor or high school teacher know that? No. Um, are there things that um, admissions officers may be looking for? Sure, is that good or bad? We can debate it, but are they using AI at this point to to read those keywords? Absolutely not, not yet. But it's coming, right? you know. It and as coming. AI and and other platforms get much more sophisticated, we can see that that's coming. I but wanted to sort of throw out just to tag on to that. I was listening to a podcast yesterday. Um, called From Admissions Beat. So it's from um, Lee at Dartmouth, but it was with Angel Perez. And if you haven't listened to it, I highly recommend they really get into all of these conversations in, a, in an in-depth way. Um, that's helpful both, I think, to us, but also to parents and students. So that was a really great um, conversation around how hmm. AI is being used or not used, yeah. among other things. Oh, yeah. And that's, that's going to be a big topic. All right, let's move on. Let's just talk about, Shannon, talk about application management and especially um, the SRAR. That's not something I'm really familiar with. Oh, um, bless you for not have, knowing that. <laughs> yeah, but my students have to fill out the their, all, their, all their classes and stuff on the A to G. So that adds a whole nother level of Yeah, uh, there complexity. really are so many ways that kids are now having to self-report their yep. courses and grades. And it's it's not necessarily new, but it's newer. More schools have added additional requirements. So the SAR, the SRAR, is the self-reported academic record. Um, in Texas, you know, there are several schools that use it. a and a big one. And you can't, you have to submit your application and you then you have to separately submit your SAR and then you have to link them together. So that's one way to do it. That also started popping up after students applied in their applicant portal is like, all of a sudden, here's a new thing, like at Northeastern. And people were like, what is this? So they're requiring the transcript and they're requiring kids to self-report. Other schools are doing their own version of that. Um, there might be the courses and grades section on the Common App. There might be the SRAR. There might be a whole separate thing, University of Houston, I'm looking at you. And then um, and then you've got the UCs where you just have to do it again. So, I mean, I've had students who have had to four different ways enter their courses and grades, which, A, it seems redundant. It seems like a lot of work that the kids are doing, I think, that the colleges should be doing. Um, or they shouldn't have to pay an application fee if they're doing half the work for them. And then also be more transparent about... I wish colleges were a little more transparent about this is coming. Hey, we're testing it. Mm -hmm. We're trying something new. Great. Put it on your sheet. Of, here's your checklist. So that was really frustrating. And for me, I have in my contract that kids have to um, submit at least two weeks before a deadline. And partly because there are things like that, that if, 
if you submitted the day something's due, you now don't have time to log in, get your credentials, and then complete that requirement. And I know that stressed a lot of people out this year. So that's been kind of um, new. Yeah, and I have another thought about obligations, but I'm also happy to let somebody else jump in on that. Um, well, let me let me ask a question. Do the colleges require the transcripts in addition to the SSAR, or does the SSAR replace the transcripts until they're admitted? It depends. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Like everything in college admissions. Um, like for AM as an example, because they're auto admit for the top 10%. If you're a top 10%, they also require that transcript that has your rank on it. But otherwise, if you're not, it's just the SRAR. Um, I think there was a question about Oregon this year and that happening. It's like, do you want the courses and grades? Do you want the transcript? Do you want this self-reported thing? Like, what do you want? And it was super unclear. So I think it's, it's again, one of those other things where you really have to look at every single institution um, and figure that out. I think I heard from UT, University of Texas, that they actually require it for out-of-state students, which I didn't wouldn't have known about because I only have in-state students. Um, so we're all kind of watching to see if that's going to transition as well. I want to jump in on this as well, because I saw I just had a very interesting thing happen. So you can see that the colleges are paying attention. So um, this one of my trends that I'm seeing this year is more of my students um, held or, or put in a hold request to their high schools for their formal transcripts. Um, for the schools that aren't taking the SSAR, that we have to, you know, you can put a hold on it. You can submit your transcript. You still have to do something. You still have to submit transcript, but it could go out in October, and then it's just a junior year transcript versus one that has first quarter grades. One of my other trends, we can talk about it or not, is I've had more students struggling in math as the COVID cohort runs through. So mm -hmm. kids that are recommended for pre-calc, calculus, calc AB, and then they're pulling a C in the first quarter. Um, and so those are the kids who may want to hold their transcripts. And then the question is, do the colleges turn around and request them or do they operate on whatever transcript you give them? And the answer is, it depends. There are a number of small and, and uber selectives. They're always going to want the first quarter transcript, right? But I actually had a student through the portal had their transcript requested after a transcript had been submitted. In other words, the university in question wanted the formal transcript, in this student's case, no problem. She just had the guidance counselor send it again, and she got an admissions accept a few days later. In other words, they had identified her and said, well, we need the senior year first quarter. This happened this past month, not now, it was in November. So they knew what they were asking for. They were asking for a November transcript, and it was directly you know, related to issuing that that acceptance, um, even though she would have had to prove it, what they needed was those senior grades. So that's, that, it's an interesting kind of wild west scenario. Um, and I think we may see more universities actually requesting what they want, even if they don't require it, because they're seeing more and more early applicants. Right, right. And I expect there will be redundancy. Um, they're going to want the transcript if schools are uploading through SCORE or Naviance or something, they're, they're sending it all together anyway. Mm -hmm. um, but what, how the schools are managing all of that, I think they're, they're still figuring out as well. So it's, that's been, um, a big, big shift this year. The other thing I was going to mention about just trends and applications. And one thing that I noticed with my students is that they're sort of terrified of doing anything incorrectly. Like they, there's a question, do you have a copy of your transcript in front of you? Yes or no. And they are, they're like, what do I pick? I'm like, well, what's the answer? Is it yes or is it no? But they're so afraid to just click the wrong thing. I feel like much more than in past years. And I've been wondering if it's been this fear, this general fear has come from the pandemic, I, right? Every Everybody's been sort of holding their families close and near, nobody could leave. And so it's kind of like, no, we need to fly and, and spread our wings. And everybody's just this sense of terror and fear. So I don't know if other people have thoughts about that, but it's been an interesting thing to observe for me. A couple of people in the text string are saying, yes. <laughs> 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 Kathy, have you experienced that as well? So um, I have quite a lot of students apply to Clemson, Tennessee, 
Florida State and a handful of other schools that require the SRAR and terrify because it's not an easy it's not an easy um, process to fill it out. Like, especially if you have students that have taken semester long classes, year long classes, pass fail classes, you know, it, there's just so many different variations within that. And it, there's no like, it, it, and and you know that students that aren't getting help from IECs have to be making errors, right? You know it for sure. Um, something else to throw out there. I don't know if anybody else has experienced with that. I worked with I worked with twins that go to go to school in Dubai this year, and they both applied to Clemson, and their guide, their school guidance counselor was unfamiliar with the SRAR, so getting information from her was really challenging. And I had the students reach out to to Clemson, and one of them got an SRA waiver, and the other one just got put into the regular decision pool. So it's just like, just, just no like uniformity. It just makes it really difficult. Yeah. Yeah, it, it does. Well, again, I heard a podcast too, where, um, from the common app where she talked about the fear of just hitting the button period, you know, yeah. a lot of students like this is final. Like I am now people are going to judge me and evaluate me and, you know, and I'm, I won't have a chance to go back and right. fix it. And so, you know, there's a huge amount of angst and anxiety that goes with that. So, yeah. And, and, a, and a belief that one little mistake is going to der derail the rest of your application that you right. accidentally right. put in that you got a B minus instead of a B on one cl on one class in your S. I mean, there really is that belief that that one mistake mm -hmm. is going it's going to be the reason you didn't get in. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I didn't put in my AP scores or you know mm -hmm. things like that. So um, that's definitely. Are you still seeing the impact of COVID grading and late policies? Um, you know, we're, we're this this class, they've had, some of them had two years of COVID. So can I take that one? Because I literally yeah, just do. finished working with a student who, I kid you not, handed in his AP lit summer work at the end of October, early November, which meant that he was writing essays for his AP class that were due in the summer because it, and they, he goes to what I would say is one of our like flagship Charlotte public schools. Um, just no, no penalty for late work, but that's not every school. But I've definitely seen that some schools and teachers have been much slower to return to pre-COVID, you know, boundaries on handing things in and penalties for submitting things late. Mm -hmm. I've seen great inflation. Oh God. Where, especially in math, where these kids don't have a strong algebra foundation because of COVID. And then they have great grades in algebra two and they're, you know, flailing in pre-cal because they just don't have the skills. So we're I'm working with some kids to go and get outside tutoring to just go reteach that algebra foundation that they never got. They're not testing well. And their grades are okay, and they've met the requirements to graduate, but they're going to go to college and fail out of math. And that's yeah, I've never I, had, I, I have, have never had that. This is absolutely a trend that I am seeing as well, Shannon, and it is particular to math. And I agree with you. I think it is being passed through algebra two. That's the foundation of all future math. And um, it's really quite shocking. I'm not sure why last year's class, I mean, what it was, I'm trying to go, go back and do the math, but um, you know, it, it's got to be a COVID effect. Yeah. Yeah. And that's the thing. We're going to still see this COVID effect next year and probably the, at least the following year after that. So it'll be interesting to see the ramifications throughout that long term. Aspect. And Cindy, I hear, you know, I, I read in the chronic letter of the UC Bulletin. I mean, I do understand that there are there's some ruffling, and I think this happening in Texas as well, where math professors, college math professors are being told, meet the students where they're at. And some of these math professors are saying, look, I teach calculus. I'm not going back and reteaching algebra. And so there's there's a little bit of, a, um, it, it plays out in college as well. And, and, and that plays out on the pages of the Chronicle of Higher Ed as the faculty are dealing with it on, on their level. And administrators are saying one thing, and the you know, math department is like, this is not what we do. We don't tell our calculus professors to run office hours for algebra. Right, right. And that's a very good point. 
So um, I'll bring up next week, I'm going to be talking to Corey C. Miller, and she's going to be talking about Gen Z in the in a post-COVID world. So I'm sure she has some research. They're going to be releasing new research in January, not only just from domestic students, but for international perspectives. So um, it'll be interesting to hear what her point is from that exact topic, because it is. It's definitely going through. All right, well, let's move on and let's talk a little bit about college essays. And I can see we've already got some things in the chat that we're going to come back. We're going to leave 15 minutes for questions. So if you have a question, stick it in the question so that we have it available to go to. Um, college essays. Now, because of this SCOTUS decision this summer about basically race and admissions and taking that out as a factor, it made prompted a whole lot more types of essay questions in to this year's applications. In California, we haven't had race and admissions since 1996, I believe. So it it's something that our public schools have been dealing with, and you know they found other ways to handle it. And mostly, it's they have like the University of California has. 14 things to go from. Now they have 13 because they don't have testing. But just seeing that proliferation of what is your life experience? What is your community experience? I have a very diverse students that I work with. I have students who are Hispanic. I have a young lady this year. She's Hispanic and Indian, but her last name is like Smith. So nobody would know from listen, looking at her name that she comes from such a diverse background. And um, so, you know, often have just a lot of different students. And what I have found is they, I really had to prompt them to write about their ethnicity, their race, their background. They want to talk about other things. They, it's not forefront on their minds. Um, for some students it is, but it was a little, you know, it was hard for them um, to, to incorporate this in. So some did and some didn't. So I'm wondering what other people's experiences were with these life experience uh, type of questions. I can go. I, I worked with a student this year who came to me sort of late in the process. Um, his mom was from Colombia and his dad from Mexico. And he, and I don't remember which one of the essays he wrote. It might've been for Duke. I don't remember which one it was for, but he, he, like, we really had to talk about, you know, how can I get across, like, you know, he wanted it to be clear in his, in his essays that his experience has been different than the peers he goes to school with in suburban Atlanta. Um, so that was an interesting conversation of, of ha having him really reflect on, okay, well, what are your, what are your experiences like and how are they different? Like, and how can you, how can you talk about that in a meaningful way where it helps the reader get a sense of what your lived experience has been like year in and year out. Mm -hmm. And, you know, it, it didn't come right out. He was like, well, I really don't feel any different. And then he told me that when he was in elementary school, he was the only person in his entire grade that spoke Spanish at home. So I'm like, okay, well, that's different. And so we were able to really, really sort of pull out some things, but it wasn't easy. To your point, it wasn't the first thing. Yeah, they don't want to be value. by that. They want right. to, like, here's other things that I want the college right. to know about me. Right. So, Shannon, what about for you? Um, I think some of the conversations I have with students is to help them celebrate who they are, whatever that means to them. And it's interesting because kids, I think by nature, want to be like everyone else. They want to fit in. They don't want to be different. And so flipping that narrative around to what makes you different and stand out is really confusing for a lot of kids. So there are a lot of questions about what is my identity? What does that even mean? Who, what is my community? Because they like, I do all the same things that everybody else I know does. We play yeah. the same sports, we do the same activities. I, I, I'm not, I don't have anything different. So there's a lot of conversations around it. Even if you do similar activities, your lived experiences are yours and the way you approach things and things that you do at home. And, and kids for sure have unique things that <laughs> about them, but they're not good at figuring out what those are right away. So I agree with Kathy. It's, it was really pulling that out of 
you know, kids are like, I'm a vegetarian. I'm like, okay, that's a little different. It would, you know, let's just keep going. What else? And it was, that was a big, big conversation this year. Yeah. Sheila, what about for you? Uh, I guess I have two responses to that. One is I, I certainly have some students who are very, very strategic and, and they just, you know, if they have an identity to quote unquote sell, they do it. Um, but I would say one, one reaction is that parents often call and say, wait, I, you know, my kid needs to do this to identify who they are and they want to write about something else. And then I tell them about the additional information section and they're much more focused on that. I would say my second reaction is um, working with kids who may not fall in the underrepresented groups. I'd say they have been frustrated. And I have certainly heard from some kind mm -hmm. of high flyers where Typically, I'll say, you know, that the personal statement, unless you're applying to Chicago, really isn't the place to write a treatise on your academic interests. And then they come back and they're like, now I've got no place to do it. What I want to talk, I'm supposed to be going to college. Why aren't they asking me about what I'm interested in? Why are they asking about my only this community? I would say that this whole kind of trend of character-based admissions and everything, there are kids who are very unhappy with it because they're, you know, they literally say, but I'm applying to college. Don't they want to know what I want to do, well, you know, what do I think about? And, and so I think that's an interesting takeaway. And I hope that somebody out there in the ether hears this, that there are kids who are feeling like, hey, I'm taking this very, very seriously. I'm applying to a serious academic institution to get educated and you're not asking me about it. And I, I know I tell them they have transcripts and the courses, but many of these kids really do want to talk about. And I found this year for the first time, there oftentimes isn't a place in the supplements to do it. And the kids- right want it. Mm -hmm. It's interesting. Yeah. If the school doesn't ask why your major or why did you pick this is what you want to study, then where else do they talk about it? It has to be in the personal statement. Um, it it's, can be very uh, frustrating. Yeah, or the additional info, but you know, we yeah, all exactly. practice a long time. Remember that, you know, the kind of why do you want to study what you say you want to study question was you know, kind of the most frequent one pre-COVID, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. And that's on. So kids with older siblings, they actually are aware that that's how it used to be and it isn't for them. And for some kids, that's good. For some kids, that's bad. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah, that's, it is. It's, that's difficult um, to be able to incorporate for sure. So, um, well, and it just <clears throat> means that we start those conversations of helping to pull that information out do it in groups. I've done group essay workshops. Many of us do that. Some people are offering courses, whatever it is you need to do to be able to help start helping students. Because developmentally, this is not something that they're used to or comfortable doing either. We're asking to do something that they've never been asked to do in or rarely asked to do in an English class. So it, it's a whole new experience for them as well. So that's, yeah. So we could spend, you know, we spent a whole time just on college essays. Kathy, let's talk about family dynamics. And, you know, we've gotten into this a little bit already in terms of students' anxiety. What about parents? What have you experienced with parents? So I've definitely noticed this year more than others. And I can already see it in my classes of 2025 and 2026 coming down the pipeline. Just what seems to be an increased desire to be more involved by parents. And I don't know what's fueling that, but part of me thinks, you know, in the post COVID world, it, it's, it's anxiety. Like, you know, it wasn't that long ago where kids were doing school at the kitchen table and the parents were sort of felt responsible and, and to some extent were responsible to ensure everybody was sort of checking, checking in and, you know, making sure everybody was online, doing what they needed to do. And that has definitely been different for me. I mean, I've worked with teenagers and parents and families for almost 20 years. And this year it, it's been noticeable. I even have parents that are texting me the day before I have a meeting with students, like filling me in on what questions I'm going to ask the students. So I really feel like part of my work this season is to put my educational psychologist hat on to figure out, okay, what are some ways that I can help 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 parents manage this anxiety and frankly you know in the, in the process make my life easier so that really is like a project for me I don't, I don't know if other people have Sheila Shannon Cindy have you noticed increased anxiety and 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 desire to be involved by parents this year yes 
Yes. And I wonder, yeah. actually, I, I had a student write a very interesting essay for me, which made me think about it from the parent angle. The student wrote her personal statement on what it was like to be the oldest of five during COVID and watching her younger siblings deal with the kinds of challenges, social challenges that she had dealt with in a different way, but she could actually see them. So the you know one was worrying about she was too short. Another sister was worried about her red hair. All these things, she goes, oh my gosh, they're me. I never would have seen this except that we were all at home together. And I'm wondering if the parents being at home with their kids for two years and seeing everything and gradually getting more invasive, they just can't let go now. Yeah, I think so. And it's become like their new norm. They don't even realize it. You know, they've just sort of taken on this role. And then with with students, like I, I feel like I build a lot of accountability into everything I do with, with young people. But this year I've had way more students canceling meetings, missing deadlines again than ever before. And we were talking a little bit about I was talking about my student who, you know, was doing his AP lit work in the late fall and handing it in with no deadline. I feel like you know, deadlines are no longer real, real deadlines. So again, putting them on that educational psychologist hat during this, this, this downtime to figure out, okay, what are some ways where I can increase that accountability and help students sort of stay on task? Because when they don't, it not only, you know, stresses me out, obviously, but it also, it does them as well. You know, all of a sudden deadlines are looming. They had a good plan. They didn't follow through. And I, I don't know what the cause of it is, but I do think it's it's got to be reminiscent of what, what we saw during COVID. And of course, very reasonably, deadlines were dropped and multiple submissions were allowed. But that is still the norm in many of the classrooms of the students that I'm working with. I don't know if other people are seeing that. Shannon, what about from you, your experience? Um, Yes. One of the things that I do is I don't allow parents in the meeting. And at the very beginning of the cycle, no. you can tell from the body language, I was like, is there somebody in the room with you? And then the mom was <laughs> oh, like, no. it's me, I'm hovering. And so I had, I said, listen, you can have, I'm happy to have your own meeting and conversation with you so that you can give me all your anxiety and stress without, but I'm protective of that time with my students because this is not healthy for either of you. And she agreed, she backed off, she stayed out. But then when she was feeling ramped, I said, when you start to feel ramped up because you're listening to all the noise out there from other parents, mm -hmm. the media, Facebook groups, whatever, I want you to call me so that we I can talk you down and you can get back to where I need you to be and, hear, and remind you how best to support your child. And I, I feel like for the most part, that's pretty effective that parents just need an outlet which mm -hmm. has been more, I've had more parents take me up on that this year than any other year ever, but I'm okay with that because it really has allowed the students to take control of their journey. Um, I think it's about lack of control. I think there's already so much lack of control in this whole process historically, but with COVID, so much was lost that people are grasping at whatever. I think it's scary. It's a scary world out there. I mean, we have war right now. I mean, there's just so much going on. I think it's that lack of control. My kid's going to be leaving soon. Um, and that probably is a scary, I, I'm sure it's a, it's a, there's a lot more going on in the minds of parents that are sending off their kids now than there was when I, when my first one went to college, for example. Yeah. Yeah. For sure. Yeah, I don't let parents in my meetings either. I mean, more like in the background, like texting me like the day before meetings or or emailing me after I have a meeting, asking me questions that I already answered with the student, maybe even put notes. There's just this like it's it's almost like in panic mode. And I do like you, Shannon, I agree. I always say if you're stressed out, don't don't be do go through that alone. Feel free to reach out it's it's a scary time. So I do think, you know, part of my work this season is is helping, you know, I don't know whether it's me having to better manage expectations or having to reach out to parents more. I don't know. I'm open. I'm open to suggestions in terms of, do you find that your parents sometimes will reach out and ask you questions that you've answered in an email that you've already sent them and then maybe they just didn't read the email? Or they just need extra reassurance. Oh yeah. Yeah, it could be. Yeah. And, and yeah. I, and I get that. Like, and especially when I'm busy, email gets buried, right? Mm -hmm. I, I try to give people some grace because mm -hmm. it is stressful and I want to sort of give people the benefit of the doubt that they, if they miss an email, I might go, Hey, yeah, happens. making sure you got my last email, just copy and paste the response again, like, and send. And then right. that doesn't take any time. And it, 
I just feel like it continues to build goodwill. And they're like, oh, sure. so great. So I think just giving people grace sometimes can be helpful for all of us. Yeah. Sheila, mm-hmm. what about from you, your perspective? Um, yeah, I mean, I guess, I, you know, I've worked with a pool of students for many years, but there's always high anxiety parents. <laughs> um, <laughs> very impressive for in Boston. Uh, you probably Beijing and, and New York do us one better. But um, yeah, I think there, I think there's increased anxiety. Like both of you guys, I also, you know, kind of plead with my parents, hey, if you're feeling anxious, call me during the school day. Don't call me at night. Don't call me when I'm working with students. Call me during the school day. Um, with, with, package students that I think is part of the service. And I think it can be very, very helpful to the students to have their parents have an outlet for their nerves that isn't the student. Um, and I, I, I'm going to forward, everyone, pass along something that someone passed on to me a decade ago. I heard Jeff Salingo bring it up in his podcast recently, which is, you know, it is a great piece of advice. I tell every parent I start working with, you know, um, in the junior year and the senior year, please pick one time per week, a single hour in which you will talk about college with your student. I did it with my own kids. And then otherwise you don't talk about it. Um, I think that is one of the best piece of advice we can give our parents. I really stand by that. Yeah. And it helps the student so much like mom, dad, we're not talking with Sunday afternoon is when we talk about this. Don't ask me now, you know, and the students will really um, enforce it too. And, and that just helps them even like for Thanksgiving and Christmas, where are you going? What are you doing? Who are you going? You know, those those are off love up topics. And I, I, school, school performance is another, is another, that's a perfect one for the once a week. Decide one day a week that you're going to look at it because grades get updated every day, right? So like the parent that wants to talk about their kids' grades every single day, I mean, that can be so toxic in their relationship. Yeah. Yeah. It's, you know, talk about ramping up anxiety. Right. So I want to address, you know, just like parents in meetings and things. I've always, but again, I have a, we all have different types of students right. or audiences that we serve. And I've always told my families going to college, the students going to college, but the family is sending them. So I try to incorporate a lot of of self-reflection, family activities early on. And then when we get to the essays, then, and, and mom and dad are always involved in all of that. You know, the student took a career assessment. Well, what career? So they all, we all get to talk about it. But when we get to the essays, like mom and dad, goodbye. I'm going to be working with your student and the same kind of thing. If you want to have a meeting with me or I need to have a meeting, you know, like when you finalize the college list, you know, everybody's there, signs off on the line. But but at one point, at a certain point, you have to, the parents have to take that extra that back seat and and we putting our psychologist hat you know help and encourage them and teach them what to do because mm-hmm. otherwise I have a parent literally from last year who is moving to the town where her son is transferring so she can still be where her son is going to school and I've had lots of conversations with him I've had she was the nightmare parent from I, you know, I've been doing this how many years? I've never had a parent as bad as she was. And I was like, how do you feel about this? There's nothing he can do about it. She's moving to Santa Barbara. So he said, I won't see you all the time, but you know, it's, it's tough. All right. Well, we're getting to, I want to, one more topic we want to bring up and then we're going to take questions, but um, Shannon, let's have you talk a little bit about the financial affordability conversations. Yeah, Um, I definitely have noticed a trend and and it it has increased huge amount this year that families are talking more about budget, um, wanting to have more affordable options, whether they are able to pay versus willing to pay is a big conversation. So historically, Texas students have typically applied to the two sort of large flagship schools um, in the state. And it's been a challenge sometimes to get people to look outside of the orange and maroon, but we have a lot of fantastic institutions in state. So I feel like families are more willing and getting excited about other in-state options. Um, And they're looking at, hey, we need, here's our budget. We either want to pay in-state or that amount. So if we can get a private or an out-of-state to be that amount, we'll look at it. We'll consider that. But they're very thoughtful about the investment. Um, They're wanting the scholarship schools. And they're certainly more open to 
the understanding that you're going to get the most money at the schools where you're in the top of the applicant pool. Mm -hmm. So those aren't going to be the most selective schools. And so getting them to understand that relationship has, you know, been a good conversation. Um, but, but it's definitely been a bigger conversation for my families this year than ever. How about Kathy or Shannon? What about for you guys? I would say that I, that I actually find myself spending a good bit of time trying to to help families stay within the budget that they tell me that they have for college. Um, I had a student just just recently whose family like swore up and down, you know, thirty thousand a year is the maximum we're going to pay because I mean you can go to Carolina for twenty five if you live in state in North Carolina, so thirty thousand. And then, you know, that their son, lo and behold, applied to a school ED that was 60000 a year. So, you know, I, I don't have students that seem to be over or parents who seem overly worried about the cost of college, even though I know from the from early conversations that they're not in a position to pay for that. So it saddens me when their kids end up going to colleges that I know are going to either, you know, put them put the family under duress you know, knock their retirement way out into the future. But there's only so much we can do about that, right? Right, right. And ultimately, it's up to the family to decide. So. It is. If, if, if prestige is like the most important thing, you know, it's encouraging to me, Shannon, that you have your families that are excited about the other schools in Texas, because we have some other fantastic schools in North Carolina. And a lot of my North Carolina families, like, look down on those schools. It's almost like a badge of honor to look down on them. And it's, it's so counterintuitive to me because the outcomes from those schools are great. They're phenomenal. Um, so hopefully, hopefully over time as it, and, and we're seeing that pressure right now where, you know, Carolina is rejecting more and more people, NC State's rejecting more and more people. So their options, if they're in state, are going to be the other schools. So I'm hopeful that there'll be some excitement around some of these other great schools. Yeah. Yeah, well, Belinda. I'm sorry, yeah. Belinda in the chat says she loves Queens. I love Queens as well. In fact, my daughter's a senior there and my stepdaughter graduated there from last year. But Queens is expensive. I'm thinking more like UNC Charlotte, App State, the Honors College is there. They've got all these, like, we've just got these great programs that I really am trying to find ways to get families to be more excited for what they can get for $25,000 a year because it's good. Yes, same. You don't need to go to Georgia and pay 50 as a North Carolina resident. <laughs> Or University of Colorado in Boulder and pay fifty five sixty as a California student. Yeah. So, yeah, but it's that is also going to be another big topic, and we'll be covering that in future um, twenty twenty four Friday forums. You know, the FAFSA isn't coming out until December, late December. We're all saying it's going to be December 31st. I just had an, heard an NPR report this morning. It's like, oh, the FAFSA is going to be easier and blah, blah, blah. It's going to come out in late December. And I'm thinking, yeah, probably midnight on December 31st. <laughs> Um, but that's going to have huge implications for a lot of students and families. And I know a lot of families are worried about that. I've had more students and families this year contact me going, aren't I supposed to fill out the FAFSA? Can I do it now? I'm like, no, not this year. Um, and am I supposed to do the profile? And what is that going to look like? And <clears throat> those kinds of things. So there's going to be a lot more impact on that we're going to see especially in next year's season as we look up so um lots of lots more topics lots more that we could cover let's see what questions i see we've got a couple of questions carmen so go ahead sure. so how do you handle divorced parents financially just um, in I, or relationally. I believe they mean in terms of um, family boundaries and the conversation that was a little bit earlier. I'll take this one because I had a doozy of a circumstance last year. So first of all, as a former lawyer, I now have a, you, you can't really call it this, but I have, I revised my contracts for that situation. Um, so that's one and make sure that both, you know, both parents are signing and what have you. But, um, I got into a situation where I was on a zoom with two divorced parents who basically argued with each other over my zoom. Right. And I, I swore this is never going to happen again. So, um, what I do now, besides kind of making sure that both parents understand what is involved in the contract is that I do not accept any longer um, a 
mandate, which I used to get in the past, where a parent would say, any communication you give to parent A needs to go to parent B. I have shut that down so that I can simply communicate with one parent and or the other parent. But if they can't communicate with each other, I'm not going to be the middleman in that way. So that is a big change I made um, th for this year. That's a very good idea. And I know a lot of times people will have, make sure like on their contracts, that is just, especially for divorced parents, that one parent signs and is responsible and, and don't right. deal with the splitting. Right. He's going to pay half and she's going right. to pay half or the, you know, both parents A and B are going to pay half. You know, you, you don't want to have to deal with that aspect. So um, what are some other ways that you've run it, you've dealt with it? Shannon or Kathy? I, so I only contract with one parent and that's the parent that I work with. And I think in the initial call, there have been, a, I might change if I have a really horrible situation. So I'm just throwing that out there. But so <laughs> far the divorce parents that I've had, it's been pretty amicable where we set up in the initial meeting before I even decide if I'm going to work with this family how this is going to go. And it's really going to be with one parent and then they're going to be in charge of communicating or just like the student might be at different houses when they meet with me, but I don't have meetings with both parents. I send them the invoice. I don't care who pays it, um, but I'm only sending one invoice. So that has so far worked out. Good. Good. Well, I'm sort of like Shannon. I, I think I've been pretty lucky. Last year I had my first difficult situation, but I ended up ending that the, the, it's the first time I've ever fired a client was last year. And I don't think it, I don't think it's because they were divorced, but I do think because the expectations between the parents were so different and that they're just, they just weren't on one side. So like you, Shannon, I may have to adapt if I have a situation like you had last year, Sheila, but so far so good. Lucky. I know of a colleague who in her contract, she has an addendum and she charges extra for a divorced parent. So if you want it, if she, if the expectation is that both parents want to communicate with her, like it's an extra fee. And I, as a lawyer, just throw out, know the laws in your state. And if marital status is a protected status, be careful. You may be opening yourself up to liability there. Wow. That's interesting. Yeah. I see then the chat about grandparents. I've had grandparents, godparents who have been the ones who initiated the, um, the coach, you know, the counseling. And then, so then that adds a whole nother third party because they end up being the ones that are paying for it many times or, you know, things like that. So, um, yeah, that's, that's all part of our business practices and what we, what we need to do. Let's go on to our next question. Carmen, go ahead. The next question, how do we as IECs know if there is a consistent grade inflation now that schools are not ranking? How do admission teams know? That's a huge topic, grade inflation. And if there's no testing, then they're relying on grades and, you know. I'm kind of no tipping ranking. my hand here, but, you know, I, this is, I, I you know. I am not a fan of test optional admissions. I'll just come right out and say it. Not, um, not for everyone, not for everyone. But um, it is it is problematic. And the answer to the question is they can't always do it. That's why they have admissions offices where you've got state reps and the, the duty of the admissions officer for your state or your region is to know these high schools and hopefully know trends like that. Because I will tell you another trend is that the school profiles are getting more and more opaque as schools themselves try to game the systems and help their students. So the answer is, it, it's supposed to come through the regional admissions rep. Can they keep up with all those high schools and which one's grade inflating and which one isn't? No, and they never could. And, and you know, you know, your English grade may depend on which English teacher you get. So, you know, that was the reason or one of them, other than equity way back when, um, for test scores, right? It was to be a check and balance against the grades. Um, and we don't necessarily have that for, for all applicants anymore. And it, it makes it a very sticky problem. It does. Well, and then you also have other trends like here in California, there's a huge uh, push for dual enrollment and students not only are taking classes at the local community colleges, the community colleges are coming to the high school to offer them. So then who's teaching it? Is the high school teacher who's certified for the community college? Is it the community college professor? How are the colleges going to count that? And then when you do international, this is a question I asked a lot of the international schools when we did visits was how do you count, you know, a college class? They didn't even know what to do with it. You know, like they had no idea how to handle that. And yet 
I probably 90% of my students have at least access to a community a college class. And a lot of schools are, and if you're an early college program, then that adds a whole nother level. And they're reducing number AP and increasing number of college. So, you know, how do you look at that? Well, too? I found out years ago on a college visit that this was so eye-opening for me that the college tracks students, their college GPA by their high school, as long as they had a certain number of students from any given high school. And mm -hmm. so they can see like, that's how they start to really know high schools too, is because, you know, regional admissions reps turn over all the time. They go, hey, this high school is a higher than average GPA and or graduation rate at our university. And that was just like, wow, I had no idea. And so now I sometimes I'll ask schools and I'm visiting if they do that. It's an interesting way to also see how high schools, kids from those high schools are performing. Yeah. And they can also see over, over years, like I, I've worked with students in one particular school for over 15 years, and I've definitely seen the grade inflation creep and it, it's out of control now. But, you know, the students... The, the colleges like Carolina have to have seen the increase in the GPA, you know, by several, you know, tenths of percents over over the years. They they have to know that. So, you know, I don't know how they track that data, but it's got to be there. Yeah. Oh, yeah. I'm sure they have it in a database um, and have access to it, especially on a from a state perspective. But it's it's hard because not all schools offer profiles or know how yeah. to do a profile. This is one of the assignments I have in my UCLA college admissions class is look at a high school profile and evaluate it. What does what does it do well and what does it not do well? And Jeffrey Salingo talks about that in the school too. It's not the student as much as the high school where they come from that's right. being evaluated. So and yeah, I had a Notre Dame admissions officer say, oh, I'll learn that in the college, um, you know, in the high school's profile. I'm like, well, you're assuming they're going to send you a profile. Not all high schools have a profile to even send. <clears throat> so it's, yeah, it's it's going to be, it's another issue that I th we're going to see more and more ramifications and complicated with the whole COVID we are out of time. Thank you so much, you guys. This has just been such a robust conversation. Hopefully everybody's enjoyed it and benefited from it. We'll try and do these open forums in 2024. I'm already lining up guests for you. I've got Robert Schaefer, who's going to come talk about the digital SAT. We didn't get to talk about that very much. So he's going to come talk about that. I'm going to have um, somebody come from the Rebel Creative, and we're going to talk about marketing. These are both in January. As I said, please join us next week with Corey C. Miller. She's going to be talking about the research she just finished and, you know, just lots of great things um, in store for 2024. Join us next week. And if you have ideas, guests, ideas, topics, please send them to me at cindy at cindymcdonald.com. And thank you, Kathy and Shannon and Sheila and Carmen for being here today. I hope you all have a great weekend and thank you again. Bye, everyone. Thank you, Cindy. Thanks, Cindy. Bye-bye. Bye. Thank you.